This is a fallacy. The pomegranate, with the universal pomegranate of the DNA of man, always existed. The forest of pomegranates, with the DNA of every organism in our known and unknown worlds, have always existed. Our thought on the earthly level in which we live, with its Euclidean perception of the Earth and the cosmos, cannot possibly conceive that the pomegranate of the universe is equivalent to the pomegranate of the human body, which also is equivalent to the pomegranate of an animal, bird, tree or plant. The immense dimension of each being or each phenomenon in the microcosm and macrocosm is enclosed within the fictional pomegranate of the pomegranate tree of life. All things fit in the one. The one fits in all things, and all together they enjoy the community of eternal life, for each form of universe has continuity within it. If I must say a few words on how I feel about myself in describing my experiences, I believe that I am a deeply religious individual. From the time I was a small child, I sought God in every manifestation of nature and human life. The worship of God in the domain of the church oftentimes led me to ecstasy, and the forms of the saints on the inner walls of churches were always for me active forces that aided the intensity of the ascent of my soul to the heavenly spheres. Today, nourished by the holy experiences in the church, as well as by knowledge of the universe, I feel that in my mind, two dominant forces coexist in full harmony, religion and science. My worship of God is not manifested solely in my neighborhood church. It is principally manifested in the temple of the universe. With the passage of time, the forms of the saints on the frescoes of the churches were identified with the forms of the sages of the ancient Greek world. My thought, on its own, sanctified Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Pythagoras, and all the great teachers of ancient Greek philosophy. Involuntarily, I equated the sacred vessels on the altar of the church with sacred vessels of nature. Trees, flowers, animals, the birds in the sky, land and sea, all the works of creation are at every moment the sacred vessels of the function of nature in the infinite temple of the Supreme Being on the altar of knowledge. Evolving from knowledge to understanding, I felt that the God of the Old Testament, who loved some and hated others, was minute before the boundless magnitude of the God that science defined in my mind and soul. I wonder, was Jesus Christ the Son of God, interpreted solely by the saints that founded the priesthoods of Earth? Or perhaps today, the presence of Christ on earth, his word, his miracles, his sacred passion, his death, his victory in Hades, and his triumphant resurrection covers the entire spectrum of laws and sciences so that man can finally start to investigate philosophically and scientifically the universal identity of the Son, his relation to the Father, and the all-holy ethereal spirit, and the substance of the Son as man for the salvation of man himself by the sun. The great question over which I anguish is why science and religion are in constant conflict. Can science, which concerns itself with the progress of research and technology, survive without the ethics taught by religion? Can religion cultivate the ethics of the individual in a world without scientific knowledge? Certainly not. Therefore, these two preeminent forces must be indissolubly bound for man to be able to confront the immense challenges that beset his individual survival 
and coexistence with the planet. If we truly believe that the universe is eternal, we must accept that the cradle of its intelligence, the Earth, is itself immortal. If the Earth is immortal, then it has within it the mechanism of self-defense against its great enemy, man. And whenever humanity violates nature and reaches the nadir of moral decadence, the structural mechanisms that keep the Earth alive are imperiled. However, when its harmonious relation to the sun and planets of our solar system, its marvelous atmosphere, its vegetal and animal wealth, its splendor and beauty approach the threshold of inverse measurement, then the Earth brings man face to face with its just rage. Through the universal dynamic and nature's endogenous tendency to preserve itself, through earthquakes and the wrath of the sea, land and air, as well as its cosmic collaboration with meteors and comets that fall from the sky, it returns man to the period of his original activity as primeval inhabitant of its crust. Today, one of six people on the planet sleeps at night in hunger. The commodities of progress do not even reach half the population of the Earth. Commodities of nature and technology produced on our Earth, a privileged 20% consume 75% of those goods. While all the remaining unprivileged people struggle to survive with the remaining 25%. Without work, health and education, you cannot be considered a citizen of this planet. On the other hand, without justice and morality, you cannot be considered a human of this planet. Therefore, a basic objective of those governed on the planet Earth is for citizens to live as human beings and for human beings to live as citizens so the struggle for progress and justice can substantially create new forms of production and consumption and for a new model of international economic class that will ensure the prosperity of world societies yet to be created. The contemporary citizen of every country in the world must understand that if the global authority of multinational companies and the stock exchange establishment does not strive to adjust to the values of the Christian religion and the ancient Greek moderation for the protection of the good and the noble, which apply to the protection of our very planet, then the planet will show its claws. Our history teaches that while the civilizations of this world are lights that turn on and off in periods of millions of years, and progress comes and goes, the planet Earth continues to turn as always, linked indissolubly to the chariot of our solar system.